I am here as a disruptionist. Disruption has become the password for politicians in this country and we seem to be blaming the disruptionist for everything wrong that is happening here. So when I sit back and think of how the youth and even some who are not so youthful, how they talk about politicians, how they say that, uh, oh, these are inept people, inefficient, corrupt, terribly bad people who are misleading this country, who are wasting millions every hour that the parliament works by not letting it perform, by damaging the progress, and on and on. I wonder whether they have really any idea of what the whole world is going through. You know, when you look at the world, when you look at Central America, South America, Africa, Middle East I won't even dare to name, Asia, look at, look at our neighborhood, all countries, all of these, most of these countries have millions of people who would give their life and limbs to get what we call a rotten, soddy governance system in their country. So is it possible that we are not able to evaluate democracy because we haven't really struggled hard to get it? There is a feeling amongst many of us that we should have a despotic, a dictatorial leader who would make us stop at every traffic light, who would compel us not to litter our neighborhood, who would compel us to do everything. That means each of us needs one cop, one policeman to guard us, to make us behave. We will not do it of our own accord. So in this background, I recollect when I was a child, my ma and my father both were in politics. My mother was a very hard-nosed, stern politician who saw success in her political career very early in life. And uh, on the other hand, my father was a very soft, affable, loving man who was uh, also into, po he got into politics, contested, ran for election twice, won all the time. So did my mother, they never saw defeat in their lives. And uh, my father, on the other hand, being a soft man, often used to get invited by his opponents in the election to come home and have lunch with him. So he had a lunch and dinner campaign trail. He never really campaigned. And yet he won every time. And I realized that in a democracy, people are willing to accept you as you are, as long as they feel that you have love for them, empathy, not sympathy, empathy for them, and you are approachable, and you are well-meaning. They are willing to excuse certain inefficiencies also. So in this background, when I started working in my life, I started first as a journalist. Then, due to various circumstances, you can say family inclinations or situations, I was asked to run for the Legislative Assembly in 1990 by a party, by a leader, which was completely opposed to the party and the policies that my mother and my father believed in. I contested the elections in 1990, didn't know anything about logistics, didn't know anything about workers, didn't know anything much about the hard facts of election, didn't have an big leader come over and uh, campaign for me. I did the campaigning myself. 
And lo and behold, I won. I was so elated, I was so happy. I thought I must be super, I must be a, you know, a great guy. When I looked at myself every morning, brushing my teeth, I was amazed with this humility in that face which was looking back at me. I thought, wow, here is this great personality. And five years passed by quickly. I did all the bit and pieces that were supposed to be done. I went to villages, I went to cities, I went to uh, meet people, I attended cultural functions, everything that was required, mandatorily required for a representative to do, I did everything. 1995 came by very quickly, earlier than I expected it, because I was just getting to relish my position. The elections were, were very well organized by me, because by that time I had my worker base, I had my logistics in place, and I campaigned, and sadly for me, I lost the election. When I lost the election, believe me, I was, the impact was so much that I fell ill for a day. And then I started blaming everybody. I thought people were bad, they couldn't recognize the greatness in me. I thought, but that happens to everybody. Jesus Christ was nailed, Mahatma Gandhi was shot down, you know, it's so sad. And uh, I blamed my logistical failure. I thought maybe the logistics were not correct. My workers were not uh, honest or not, uh, uh, you know, they were deceitful probably. And everybody else, but you know except who. Few years passed, 1998 came by. The parliament elections were scheduled. I was again offered by my party to run for parliament this time. I contested and again I won. When I won this time, I said, see, the idiots have realized what a big folly they had committed by defeating me. People, I thought, people were in a way saying, we are sorry, we apologize that we couldn't recognize your greatness and we have voted you back to office. So with that glory and with that feeling, the ego just got bloated. I just was not walking on earth, I was like a couple of feet above ground. Unfortunately for the country, and slightly for me, within 13 months there was a vote of confidence, the government lost the vote of confidence. The then Prime Minister suggested that the House be dissolved and fresh elections were summoned. So, perforce, without a choice, I was running again in 99 September. And uh, this time, I had the logistics in place, I had my workers ready, I even roped in the greatest leader of that time, who was the Prime Minister and who everybody knew would become the Prime Minister again, to come endorse me, which he did. He came to my constituency, I organized a mammoth rally. And uh, I thought whatever sharp edges were there, whatever uh, small things were undone, would get covered finally by this great leader's presence. and. Uh, I will sail through triumphantly. It so happened that this election also I lost. Then realization struck me that what am I doing? Why am I always blaming others? What is wrong is in me, not in the people, not in my organizational ability, not in my workers, not in the party or the leader. It is something within me. So I realized my ego was getting the better of me and I was rubbing people the wrong way all the time because I always thought whenever I open my shirt I will see the S, here is Superman. And Superman was 
down on his face, hit his nose hard, and nobody even looked back at him. So then, this time through, it's not that I kept away from people, I went back to the constituency, I met people, I kept in touch, and I did everything that a defeated candidate need not do. And I kept up the uh, crescendo high so that people don't think I deserted and I ran away. Then came 2004, I was again asked to run. 2004, 2009, 2014, three consecutive elections, I won. And it didn't affect my ego because I already knew how great or how small I was. This three elections helped me in realizing myself as also it taught me what my work was. What is the job of a representative? When we sit and criticize, we have to consider what is the person doing. For example, when people would pass out from exams, go and appear for an MNC company to an MNC company or start a startup, when you go and take a job, you have immediately one or two bosses ahead of you. They, if they are happy with you, if you keep them pleased, you are like set. There is nothing that is going to touch you. But for a representative, all of you sitting here are bosses. Anybody walking on the street outside is a boss. And anybody can turn around and question that what is this you are doing? We want to understand. Explain to us. Is it going to benefit us? Is it going to harm us? We don't like this. We don't like that. They have the authority to tell me that. So a representative has unlimited bosses. And yet the job is divided into compartments which are extremely varied. It's like the, uh, like the rainbow. All colors from this end to that end and everything you have to take into account. For instance, when I go to the constituency, people come up and tell me, my house is leaking, my roof is leaking. Please get it met. Somebody comes up and says, I want a job, there is this industry, give them a call, I want the job. Women come up to me, young women come up to me and they say, Sir, my husband has run away with my younger sister. Please get my husband back. And if I say with folded hands, how do you expect me to get your husband back if he has run away with your own sister? Then she turns around and looks at me, actually most of them turn around and look at me and then ask, then why have we voted you? So then I think, yeah, maybe they did actually vote for me so that if their sister runs away with their husbands, I should be getting them back. This is one part of the job. The other part of the job is legislation for which we are actually sent there. You know, people tell us that you are a disruptionist. But I know for sure that all of you, when you go and vote, when the average citizen goes and votes, they are very conscious. I would never ever underestimate the average voter. They know that they are voting a set of people because this set of people will govern and another set of people will oppose. So the job of the opposition is to oppose. I'll give you an example. The land bill. Everybody talked about it. Small part of it says that for security purposes, for defense, for social usage, if any land is required, the government can acquire it. A joker like a tasseldar, a district magistrate, a sub-collector does not like your face. 
or you misbehaved with him or her. She says, okay, I take your land. The land that your great-grandfather bought, your father lived there, now you are living there, suddenly becomes government land. You cannot say a word. Is it wrong for me if I scream and shout and obstruct the proceedings so that 50 years later people in this country do not turn around and say that what kind of legislation did these people do? Is it wrong when the government proposes that net neutrality is not required for people? Just imagine a few companies will decide what you will get on the internet, what apps you can download, what sites you can visit. Are you willing to swallow that? If I oppose that, I'm called a disruptionist. Another example. Suppose electricity, connected with this net neutrality, suppose electricity is given to your home and the distribution company decides that for air conditioner, refrigerator, there's one price. For electric bulbs, there's another light. For heating and cooling, there is another light, another price. Are you willing to accept a different pricing thing in your electricity bill? Similarly, net will also be affected like that. The other last example I would give you is of the LGBT issue. A private member's bill got introduced in the house. The people who think they are right and they think everybody else is wrong, they shouted down this private member because they were larger in number and he had just himself and one other person supporting him. So I disrupted and I said that if a man loves a woman or a woman loves a woman or a man loves a man, that is their personal choice. Can I decide what you will eat now? What color of clothes you will wear? Can the government or society at large, can it start dictating the individual's preferences? So these issues, when they come up, we have to oppose and that is what we do. And we are called disruptionists. So in this background, when if I am given a choice to have a rerun of my life and a choice what I want to do again, I can say this much. I would again be a journalist, again be a politician and have the same life again and I will enjoy it thoroughly with this kind of experience. Thank you.